What is up, everybody? And welcome on Inside, yet another edition of the Business of Social Podcast powered by STN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley. Each and every show, we talk to the experts and get their expert advice on the ever-changing digital social marketing industry. This this show is no different. Episode number 91. Um, you know, usually we go to producer KG uh, for the numbers in 91, but this is easy. And I think I think Dennis Rodman has been a uh, fixture on a couple episodes, maybe back at 73, uh, I know for sure. But 91 on the Bulls, one of my favorite uh, jerseys ever is the black 96 Bulls with the red pinstripes. Rodman number 91, that's the easy one. So this is the, the Dennis Rodman uh, podcast. And we'll be talking to Jason Del Soldado. He is the head of product at Kane Footwear. And he's also the co-founder of Clinch Golf. So he's really solving couple major issues in the sports industry I'm really excited to get into. If you're not familiar with Kane Footwear, uh, and when you first look at it, you may think it's like a croc or a very similar type of shoe, but it really is the aid and recovery after running, after sports, after anything taxing on your body and on your legs and feet. So I'm excited and kind of as a former athlete and someone that still tries to get out there and work out as much as I can, I'm excited to see what they've uncovered here, what they've solved and then, you know, the guy spent 15 years at Nike. Uh, he spent some time at Burton Snowboard, started his career at Amercombe and Fit. So talk about somebody that understands apparel, understands the consumer, understands DTC. Jason is that guy. I'm so excited to talk to him. Once again, Jason Del Soldado, the head of product of Kane Footwear and the co-founder of Clinch Golf. All right. I'm so uh, happy to be joined by Jason Del Soldado. He's the head of product Kane Footwear and co-founder at Clinch Golf. Jason, thanks for the time, man. We appreciate it. Thank you for the time. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I know you're a golf guy. We'll talk, we'll get into clinch golf and all that and more, but I know you've thought about this at some point. Who is a celebrity foursome? Uh, if you had oh, to pick right now. A celebrity foursome. Wow. Um, that I was not ready for that. <laughs> I always try to open it up with a little bit of a random, random question. So well, I go. would I would have to go with uh is this living or or or, or... whatever you want to do. Oh, I am a big Freddie Mercury fan. Huge, okay. Huge, so Freddie would be part of my foursome. Love that it. Would be, uh, Tiger would have to be. There just would yes. be. No, there would be no way that would be able to. Um, and then, I think. Wow. I'm gonna have to get back to you on the fourth. I'm thinking just like just like Barkley, just for the you know the laughs and the. Uh, that would that stuff. would be fun. I think maybe like a. Court gesture, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think the court. Oh, yeah, it would be. Yeah, I, maybe Jordan. I don't know. Maybe, Ooh, Jordan. That would be a good one. I think he might lose uh, some money. <laughs> he would get. Yeah, he would get. He would definitely take some of my money. Yeah, yeah. Some of the money. Um, awesome, man. So yeah, if for the listeners, if you could just give a quick rundown of all that you oversee as head of product at Kane Footwear, and also like, please let us know about Clinch Golf and all the fun things you're doing over there as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, amazing. Yeah. I, so Kane Footwear uh, start, launched about a year and a half, a year and some change ago last June. And we're doing some really amazing things over there in recovery footwear. Um, mm. We are gaining some serious momentum. We'll, we're going to be on 10 NFL teams this fall. Wow. A couple of NBA teams. And this is not us uh, spending money to be on the team. We went met with them. They're seeing the benefits of the footwear mm -hmm. above and beyond some of the things that they're getting from some of the other players in the industry, which are mainly slides where ours yeah. is the actual shoe. Yep. And there's a whole bunch of scientific stuff that I can go into if you'd like. Yeah. But we're really starting to mean to get, get some momentum there. And I handle just basically everything from initial concept to delivery of every part of product that we're currently doing. We have one model. Um, so we're doing Cane energy colorways. We have our core colorways um, handling um, our collaborations. We had some great collaborations this year, Spartan races. We had Ministry of Supply, which is a, a Boston apparel company. Um, and we had Athletic Brewing was another one we had this year. So we had some really big names and we have some big ones for next year. I see our college football uh, partners as well. So, college football part yeah. and that's mainly just through a through a CL through a CLC yep. through yep. a college licensing lens but we um but USC did choose to take some of the units from that and they they are wearing them this this um uh this fall so we're starting to gain some momentum some visibility um and we're on top of the and then we have Equinox for next year Mir which is a uh yep. company 
we have, um, I mean, we have a, a lot of really great um, uh, collaborations for next year. And then um, an amazing, um, what I, think, I think which dovetails really wait, great into this uh, conversation is something I brought to the table when I first came on with Kane, which was something that lived in between what you would do as a company with energy and what you would do with a collaboration, say brand to brand or business to business. And really I, I found kind of this weird zone in the middle and we ended up calling them ADs, um, athlete or artist designers. So basically what we do is we get with some some great partners of the brand within multiple industries. And the reason Kane has such a great runway is because recovery means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. It doesn't have to mean NFL. It can mean um, pretty much anything. It could mean working all day on your feet or construction or in the service industry or a nurse or any of those kinds of things. It can mean anything, any sport, any time of day. If you need recovery from being on your feet or doing something active, we have like, we have the solution for you. So there's a lot of different angles we could go and lenses we could go. So I was like, Hey, why don't we partner with people within, you know, that are partners of the brand. We allow them to design their own shoe and then use the overlapping concentric circles of who their brand is and who Kane's brand is. And there's going to be some, some shared, yep. but we're going to gain some new followers. They're going to gain some new followers. We're going to create something. We're going to tell a combined story and storytelling is really, really where it's all at right now. Really getting, people a chance to see behind the curtain and really um, align with your brand through storytelling. And if it's coming from a very authentic point of view of that combined storytelling, it really opens up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities. And we've had some really amazing ones this year, Uh, a fitness influencer uh, named Brian Mazza, uh, another fitness influencer uh, named Eric Hinman. We had Hillary Knight, who is the captain of the U S women's hockey team. And she launched hers right after they they left the Olympics this year. And then uh, an NFL trainer and an owner, co-owner of a gym in Austin. His name is Jeremy Hills. And these are the first four. And then we have a line of people who are now approaching the brand. We're getting a lot of inbound, not a lot of outbound requests, a lot of inbound requests to do this um, thing. So that's basically, uh, and, and that's just one of my jobs. So basically from, from uh, I guess you'd say soup to nuts on everything on how to create product, not only the footwear, but we have other things like bottles and t-shirts and yep. headwear and socks and everything. So Love it. And, I, and we'll get into clinch golf in a little bit, but I, I was really fascinated by checking out the website, looking at the product on Instagram. Um, I'm fascinated with the recovery portion of this whole thing, because I don't know if you guys like this, um, Similar or not, so I apologize if you don't. But you know, it looks like kind of like a croc, if you will, when you first look at the shoe. Um, but obviously, these partners of yours and your guys' initial goal here is to aid in recovery. So, uh, for my simple brain, like, can you break down the difference from wearing a slipper or a slide or wearing nothing at all around the around the house after a big workout, after a long run, and kind of what does it do for you as an athlete? So, so I'll start with a couple of things. So. Generally, we built this shoe off of a running like footwear last. So if you're getting out of a pair of athletic shoes or a pair of sneakers and you're getting into a slide, that's a completely different last. So your foot's having to uh, to mm-hmm. overcome that, number one. So we're in like a, a running shoe last. So it makes perfect sense. Your shoe gets right into what it already felt like it was into. Um, the heel capture is one of the biggest things. The differences between obviously a slide and um like a, like a croc or say uh, one of the other companies. And really what happens is when you're done running or working out or whatever, and you put on a slide, you're usually crunching up your toes. Mm. You guys will be able to see me um, or pushing them up. Hey, we're on YouTube. Make sure you uh, check out Jason on YouTube. There we go. <laughs> uh, or you're pushing your toes up in the front, trying to hold yeah. them on, right? So you're working your planter on the, un- mm. on the, on the underside of your foot. Um, you're shuffling because you've had to change your gait. So you're working different muscles when you're trying to a break. And then your heels coming off of the bottom. So you're yeah. having your Achilles. Mm. So when you lock your foot in to a cane recovery footwear shoe, the Revive 1.0, you're, you're giving yourself a break on all those places. You're not that. having to worry about keeping your toes and the foot on. And then I never thought about that too, because as a 35 year old still playing adult basketball and stuff, you know, the the planter area is so sore after an hour of running. And yeah, I definitely noticed that, you know, those different parts of the foot are still working after well after the game. 
Yeah. And then, yeah. so, and I, I, I run, I, I'm a runner. I used to play basketball when I hit 30, I, yeah. I completely put that to the side. Like, I uh, wore so the Steph many- Curry air cast braces just to you know guarantee <laughs> not injury. So I feel you. <laughs> so many of my friends were, were tearing Achilles uh, when I was still at Nike and I was not, it was nope. not something that looked pleasant to, to recover from. Yes. So I was like, I'll do whatever I can. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do my running and then that's about it. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I run about 80 miles a month and nice. try to stay up that way. And, and I was having a lot of pain at the base of my Achilles where it meets your, your mm. heel bone. And, um, and I would wear Crocs and I would wear these other ones. And it just was, it wasn't giving me what I felt like was the right amount of recovery. Right. So obviously I talked about the heel capture. There's a 10 millimeter r- rise at the heel to the toe. Um, so you're actually pushing your heel up, which again, takes, pressure off your your Achilles. The next big thing is the dual density. And, um, there's something called ask or see. It's basically when you do an injection molding, you can choose the, the, how hard or how soft you want your shoe to be. Some of the other brands, they come out of the box and they're so squishy and so soft, soft. but we liken it to, have you ever run in sand, David, Mm -hmm. you're working all of those stability muscles. Yeah everything in the toes in this and that's what happens when you're on a really soft platform you're working all those yeah. muscles in your in your shin yeah. in your calf um and and that allow you you're not giving those those muscles a break so we engineered the sole to be a little bit stiffer than it would normally be if you were to pull one of these other brands out so that you have a really really solid base to stand on while you're walking around um, and this may seem like a silly question, but in a world where let's say someone could not choose cane as a product, it seems like the science is it's almost better to put on another pair of shoes after an event and go, and when you're going home rather than maybe a slide because you're working all different times. I mean, I may be wrong there, but it sounds like the slides and, and different uh, products like that may even make it worse on recovery or at least never give your foot a break. And again, we never like to, I never like right. to answer absolutes. Um, yeah. Everyone is different. Not one product is going to be the right thing for everyone. I, I can only say that we worked with an amazing podiatrist. His name is Dr. Daniel Gettler. He's, he works out of LA. He's on the website. If you had a chance to go there, canefootwear.com. He is an amazing partner and we've worked, he works with and does a lot of surgeries on people who have had sports injuries. And he works with um, elite athletes. He works with normal athletes. And we worked with him on where the, the, um, all the nodes on the bottom of the soul, mm. where they go in order to simulate the right amount of blood flow so that you're getting, you know, um, the right amount of recovery back. And we've had a lot of, um, you know, reviews on the website of people coming to us saying, uh, you know, I've had plantar fasciitis for my entire life. I've had all these other foot ailments. I'm getting older. These shoes are, are a godsend, not I've not, never found anything else that would work. Mm. And that those are the kinds of things. And again, like I said, nothing's going to work for everyone, but we really are narrowing in on this is what we feel works for the majority. And these are the, this is the science that we've landed right. to make us to differentiate us. What are some of the studies you guys have done? And obviously I'm getting super granular on this, but it just, again, fascinates me. Um, to kind of show, I'm guessing you would, you take two different groups, one that doesn't wear the shoe, the other that does, or maybe 30 days on 30 days off. Um, but are, are you seeing like a, a, a real difference there when it comes to the next day being able to perform at the highest level? Like what, what, what are kind of the takeaways you've seen through your different trials and, and studies? Yeah. And that's the, we, and we did that, that the, it was the 30 day on 30 yeah. day off. It was a lot of wear testing. It's where mm-hmm. our, our tagline comes from, come back better. You know, you, you don't want to have, and this was happening to me, I would go for a long run and I need to take a break off in between days because that was just so painful at the base of the, of my Achilles. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I started, I have inside, I have inside canes and I have outside canes. It wasn't until I started really wearing those last summer when I first started after the, the Kickstarter went through, um, with the company, I, and again, I, I met, I met John, who's the owner and the, and the founder of Kane through a friend of a friend and ended up getting it on the Kickstarter and got the shoes and immediately saw a difference because I was wearing, I was wearing all the things we're talking about. I was at Nike for, you know, for yeah. 13 years and I was wearing the slides or the solar stuff. So yeah, the yeah. Thing, everything just was, and I didn't notice it until I tried on this mm. new pair of shoes, this new offering. I didn't realize the difference until after I tried it. And then it, well, there was no going back for me. And I think we've heard a lot of the same, of the same from some of the customers who have purchased the product. I feel like there's, we're kind of on this tiptoe or sorry, we're kind of at this juncture in 2022 now. Cause I, I've noticed like brands, I'm sure you're aware of like, 
like move on the orthotic orthotic side, but really talking about like, I love Nike. I'm like a Nike guy, but you know, some of those insoles on the LeBrons or Kobe's or what have you can be pretty basic in nature, pretty thin. And I feel like there's like a movement on the, the insole part of shoes as well, how everybody's foot's mapped a little bit different, how you should probably be more pragmatic when you're choosing exactly what to put inside your shoes. So are you seeing this trend where <clears throat> athletes, older athletes, people just really want to kind of dig in even more on the science of how can I perform better? How can I recover more? I mean, being informed is the biggest thing right now. Yeah. The, the information that you have at your fingertips these days, I mean, not to sound old or whatever, but I mean, I'm only 47, but the things that you have available right now to do, you can you can compare and contrast footwear from multiple different companies, yeah. you know, from Brooks to Hoka to whoever. And you can look at all of these uh, when it comes to like running shoes and stuff, you can look at all the benefits, the heights, the in all of those things. And I think, and honestly, a lot of the companies, especially like ours, give you the opportunity to try, you know, and then if it's not working out for you, you send it back. A lot of these companies, especially, yeah. you know, Nike is, you know, that was definitely their thing. They want to make sure that you're in the right shoe. Um, you know, I think if you go to any specialty running shoe, they allow you to try on the shoes, look at your gait, analyze stuff. You can send in videos now to companies and they'll tell you what shoe you should probably be wearing just by your, just by your gait, your pronation. So I, I completely agree. I think, um, you know, Dr. Geller has, that's a lot of his business is custom orthotics for people mm -hmm. who are going to be in athletics. Um, and there's a lot of guys in the NFL who wear these. We, we, we talk about that. A lot of guys in the NBA and. Yeah, I know Chris Paul is even an investor, along with Dame Lillard, I think in the NBA side where they have custom orthotics and they're kind of investing in a different, different opportunity for the consumer to also get in on that. So I'm, de I'm definitely seeing a shift here when it comes to people caring about yeah, there's no there's no silver bullet, and I think yeah. you don't have to force your foot or force into something that might not be working for you. There right. are so many options out there now, when and trying to find the the right custom option for you. My last geeked out question, because you know you've talked to the science and all that stuff. Um, it sounds like for ultimate recovery, if you go out and run six miles, it actually is better to wear something like the cane uh, footwear around your home rather than just being barefoot in the kitchen. Like it sounds like until you go to bed it's actually better to wear that locked in mechanism. I would fully agree. And I Got think again, I can only speak to my experience. And again, the, re the reviews that you'll see, yeah. it, it, that's why we talk about active recovery. Mm. You, I don't know a lot of people who can just go for a six mile run and then not have anything to do the rest of the day. Everybody has, I have, I have two kids, I have five and two. I have another job. I have things that I want to do. You got to run, you got to run another mile, just chasing them around, you know? Exactly. You got to walk, <laughs> you know, have to walk the dog. Otherwise he's, he's hyper, you know? So you immediately put on those mm. shoes, do that walk, you come back in, you're walking around the house, you're running errands, you're doing laundry, you're doing all those things but you're actively recovering. I think that's why with all the things I just talked about in the shoe, it's not just sitting on the couch and recovering, which would be amazing if we could all do that or putting yourself in those um, inflatable things. Yeah, get, right. You know, yeah. Going into the sauna or the cold plunge, all those are great. But a lot of people are like, reality is you have jobs, you have families, you have things to do. And that's why the active is a really big part of that, the active recovery. Um, and that's why, that's why we've engineered the shoe and we've worked to get the shoe to a place where we want people moving after they've been moving. I love that. I want to get into clinch golf a little bit because I have a lot of questions about um, just what's working for you guys in terms of moving product, especially on social with different demographics. But uh, again, digging into clinch golf, uh, I play golf quite a bit. I want to consider myself a golfer, but um, you guys are are definitely hitting an interesting niche where you. It seems like I've got to buy a glove every second time I golf because the second you start to sweat in it or what have you, it crumbles up to a hard mess. Uh, and you guys are, you know, it looks like you've created this really amazing product on the glove side uh, that just like outpaces the competitors for, for long-term use. Yeah, we, we, so I met, so I met my partner, Matt in, in 2020 and, you know, my entire career, um, you know, obviously we haven't gone back to that, but I started right out of college at Abercrombie & Fitch at 23 years old, making clothing in Columbus, Ohio, at yeah. 23, managing a $30 million business. If you know anything about Abercrombie, you know that that's their model. They like to have young people close to yeah. the consumer. And this was way back. This was in 98. So this was at the heyday. Like, I mean, things were really, really hot there. And that's where I learned everything. So I've been in product creation for my entire career, 25, 25 plus years. And Matt's in banking. And he had this idea and we lamented when we first got together for our coffee, our first coffee about the challenges that we've had over the years with leather gloves. 
And I, my first job ever at 13 years old was as a cart boy at a local golf course in North Carolina. And if you know anything about the South, it's very hot. It's very humid. Yes. I sweat a lot when I, when I, when I, when I uh, work out and again, you would see, you would be, you'd always be drying. You'd always yeah. be you know, a second, there was always tears in the palm you'd have, or you'd have really bad, um, um, uh, blisters there yeah. as well. And we just started to say, is there a different way? And he, what he, he was doing was he was using an all, an all weather glove, which is the rain glove for the winter. He was using that, Interesting. As you know, or if you don't know, like they're very heavy and they don't breathe very well. So on top of that, they would grip, but they weren't very comfortable. So we use that as a starting point. We, um, you know, with my history at Nike and in the industry was able to find some really great designers and a really great source base, um, for us to bring the product to life. And we just really started engineering and protoing and getting after versions of taking what would be a great starting point, which was that all weather glove and dialing it back on the weight, adding breathability, adding durability. We want this thing lasting for you. And people joke with me. I get joked all the time. Hey, well, that's a bad um, business plan to have something that's going yeah. to be for repeat customers. But I think if you, I think a lot of people nowadays when, you know, fast fashion is over, like maybe not over a lot of people, it's still a, a great option. And there's a lot of price point, you know, driven conversation there, but when it comes to quality and durability and sustainability, obviously is a big thing. We don't want people just going through, going through, going through, going through gloves. We want them to last a little bit longer. So we really started to build in all of those touch points for the consumer. And we found a really great product um, that we felt like was breathable enough, but yet you could, uh, but yet would stand up to, to a rain shower or stand up to someone who sweats really badly. And then we added some really great details into the glove that a lot of other gloves didn't have. Um, even some of the big players, you know, the rubber tab um, on, the, um, on the Velcro allows for easier on and off yeah. the, normal, the regular golfer, the normal everyday core enthusiast golfer takes their glove off 18 times around and puts wow. it on 18 yeah. times around. Once around. So once if you, a hole. once a hole, right? So if you think about if your hands is sweaty and you have that, that, that leather glove on and you go to pull the finger yeah. Yeah. of the leather glove, it stretches out. What leather doesn't do is rebound. Yeah. We, we picked materials, four-way stretch. We put stretch in the main material, um, in the palm material that would stretch back. So you'll get a better fit every single time you go to put this glove on. We know that it's going to last twice as long as a leather glove. We did a lot of wear testing in multiple areas of the country, Texas, the South, California, Northeast, Northwest. And we got a lot of the same. And again, if someone wasn't into the glove, the feedback that we were getting was very consistent when it came to grip in any condition, sweat yep. and durability lasting about twice as long. And, and you'll see on the webs on the, on social, you talked about it. We're, yep. we're to do a good I job. love that. It seems like you, I mean, with both companies, like you're definitely solving a pain point for consumers and, you know, I'm already sold on both products. So you probably already sold me on uh, your next consumer, but I would love to see, you know, I want to dig in a little bit more to the to what you're seeing work right now with consumers, and I'll and I'll start with Gen Z, kind of that ten to twenty five year old that I'm sure part of your product, obviously, especially when you're talking about college licensing and things like that, you're targeting. But I saw this crazy stat the other day that ninety seven percent of Gen Z is using social media to research those purchasing decisions, which is insane. Um, but with the with the younger demographic in particular. That's one thing that a lot of listeners are looking to gain from a consumer standpoint, from an audience standpoint. Uh, anything that you've seen successful when it comes to social and reaching maybe that younger demographic? Yeah, I have to say this is, I'm learning, I'm fixing the wheels yeah. as, I, yeah. as we're driving this bus on the clinch side. I can't speak, a, I can't speak too prominently right. on the team side because there is a marketing cup co co yeah. um, partner that I have at the company. Mm. Um, I can speak a little bit to it, I think seeing um you know seeing people like you in the shoes doing things that you like to do is obviously something regardless of age right you get to a point um really staying on top of color and being authentic again being at, at nike for 13 years and being at burton snowboards for eight years prior yeah. like st storytelling yes. and marketing through the lens of like wyden and kennedy and jdk for each of those companies is a big part. You want to be telling a story and being approachable and um, 
and really telling and showing people what they want, they want to see themselves doing or in. And I think that's, so that's on the cane side. Like you can see that it's very, very prominent when it comes to being active and, and, and doing your, what you need to do in the recovery part after those, those sports on the clinch side, a little different, you know, um, you know, so we're trying to figure out, like I said, I'm, I'm doing all the social. And, 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 and I think during COVID, I mean, you saw this, right. I mean, golf exploded. I think rounds in Texas alone were up 55%. You saw that across the nation. I'm because I like some golf stuff. I'm inundated with the algorithm sending me more golf stuff. <laughs> I felt like, um, yeah, just golf brands are popping up everywhere from wedges to gloves, to hats, Yep. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this in this same trajectory with your maybe competitors, but just the industry as a whole, a lot more people on social willing to spend a lot more money on their golf attire and, and gear. Yeah. And again, you want that, you want that thing that you, you can identify with, Hey, Oh, I was, you know, I, you know, and again, I think right now, and I have a really great, great friend. He, he does something very similar to this. He teaches some brands about how to talk to consumers and we have conversations all the time. He's the next Nike guy. And it's not about, Hey, I, here's what I have to sell you. And it's basically, here's what we have made that we feel like can help you with your problems. Yeah. And, and then, you know, I write a, I write a, a, a special note to every single person who buys something from us. Cause I fulfill out of the garage, which is That's awesome. awesome. Well. But, and I, cause I, cause I would want that. And I think that's anything I would want as a consumer over all of my years, I, I, we try to give to our, our, our consumers. And I think that was basically like, Hey, have you had problems with, with leather gloves in the past? Cool. We did too. Here's what we did. We think you'll like it. Let us know if you do or don't. Right. And, 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 and that's it. Like, it's not just like it at the end of the, at the end of the purchase or when I hit send and I put that in the box and I send it out, our, our, our communication and our conversation is not over. I well, want it is to- different too, right? Like it is nice from a value proposition standpoint, when you are actually solving a problem, like if you're trying to sell a t-shirt with a cool design, at the end of the day, it's a t-shirt and you're selling the brand, you're selling the coolness factor right. uh, or the head turning factor from friends or strangers. But when you actually, with both both products, you're solving an issue, being authentic is like, hey, we feel you, we've been there, uh, we solved this, we would love for you to check it out and see if it, it helps you in any way, which is, a, I think, a better from a company standpoint, brand standpoint, it's a pretty awesome place to be in if you just tell that story authentically. Right. And that's what we're doing. And again, like you've got companies like Malbon, which is a great, great company. They make really, really, really cool product. They've collaborated yep. with Nike, but there's no innovation. We wanted to start from an innovation standpoint. And I think that's where I, a little bit of my Nike background kind of came right. into the conversation. It was like, we want to start with a problem of the athlete or of the consumer or of the golfer, in, for instance, in this area. And we're going to work back. And yeah, we have a t-shirt and we have hats and I have, believe me, I have three years of designs backed up, Yeah, but that's the, that's the, that's the cherry. That's the icing. We wanted the, the main part to be, Hey, the glove is where we're going to center this brand around. We're going to tell authentic stories around the problems we're trying to solve. Yep. And we're going to build from there eventually, you know, we're two guys trying to bring some great product to life. And eventually that other stuff will come. Um, and believe me, there have no shortage of ideas, no shortage of cool ideas on that side, but it was really, let's start with that innovation. Can we innovate? If you look at everything in golf, there's not a single piece of golf equipment that has not been innovated on. When you were talking about metal woods, you're talking about hybrids, you're talking about Jordans, there's Jordans, people wearing Jordans. That's crazy. Yep. It, it used to be just leather shoes. Um, you know, you've got dry fit everywhere. You've got sweat wicking everything. You've got bags that are, you know, you got wheelie carts, everything has been innovated on and, and everyone's still making the same leather glove with different like colors or, you know, companies like Palm and Asher and everything, just yeah. different colors and prints, but it's still the same Cabretta leather glove, which I don't know if you know, it's like the way that the glove ended up happening was they foot joy pulled the internal material out from this inside of the shoe that they were making. That's fine. And just tried it on the shoe. That's the, the origin of the leather glove. Interesting. So you're talking about a footwear material that someone just put on a hand at one point. And we felt like we could approach it from a different point of view, from a future point of view, from an innovation point of view. And that's- I, I'm curious just from an entrepreneur standpoint, because I think there's a lot of listeners that have these ideas and they have the ability, they know paid social, they know marketing, they know the ability to tell a story based on them working at, you know, a, a TV network, a sports team, um, a, a Fortune 500 brand. What's the barrier of entry? Like if you were to give advice to um, a colleague that has a 
similar idea where you're solving a problem for a consumer. Um, can you kind of get that prototype relatively, relatively cheaply and kind of at least like test market it out on social media now that you don't have to have maybe the Dick's Sporting Goods contract, you go straight to the consumer DTC. I mean, talk me through maybe a little bit of the barriers of entry for that type of stuff. Yeah, I think it all depends on the product. It all depends on the idea. Um, it was a little easier for me only because I've done this for my entire career right. since college. So having the connections, I think you can reach out. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of tools uh, out in the world right now that you can reach out to find people. LinkedIn, you can reach right. out online, you can reach out on Indeed or any one of the of the sites, and you can look for someone who's in the industry who might work at a company that you you can find people a lot easier. Yeah. And I think that's how Matt and I connected. With, was it through a friend of a friend? But he knew I did something, and and it's really about networking. It's about getting your name out there. Obviously, about getting your idea out there, but getting your name out there, trying to find out. Um, you know, we did a lot of, we did a lot of research on the glove side. We bought everybody's everything. We did pros and cons for every brand we did. Hey, you know, there's companies that do make non-leather gloves, but there it's, but it's faux leather, which is even worse when it gets wet it's it. even worse when it gets. Uh, so we knew that there were people and foot, again, a lot of companies make all weather gloves, but they only make one weight and it was the super heavier one. So we knew we wanted, we knew we had a little swimming lane that we, that, a little niche area that we could get into. And I think, to, but to answer your question, it's like, I think f identify what you want, what you want, and then research the hell out of that area. And then don't be afraid to reach out to people and just say, Hey, I'd love to pick your brain. There's hey, a lot man, of people man. that That's just the, talk. And then one piece of advice I always say is when I start my company, the same thing, I just reached out to NBA, NFL teams, like, can I just pick your brain on if this business idea would even work? And you start hearing the same themes and it allows you to kind of hit the bullseye on what, what the, you know, the market needs. Yeah. Right. And again, I, I, you know, myself and, and my partner, Matt, we were super nervous, you know, it was the middle of 2020, you know, I had left Nike, um, you know, to, I had a you know, baby on the way we had chosen, we were going to go self fund route. We were not going to give the company away. We didn't even know what it was, but we knew that it was worth trying. Love that. And again, that was, uh, and I think that was the, that was the big thing. So it's worth, it was worth trying. And, and I, I think. Yeah. And I think in 2022, just the fact that you can go direct to consumer and you can launch an Instagram and you can maybe, you know, get a small order and just kind of like test these things out on your own. No time in business history has this ever been, I guess, the barrier of entry to at least try those things with the amount of research and the, and the um, sweat equity that goes into it. But it's pretty awesome that you can have that idea work at nights, drink some coffee, you know, do the thing and just at least, at least see if it, if it takes off, which is awesome. So yeah, give it a go. Uh, There's no, I mean, if you can, you know, cool. We, we have a group of friends that we have like a, it's a WhatsApp and it's basically called like the, there's a group and it's like the idea, it's the idea factory. And every I time someone it. comes up with an idea, we like, we throw it in there and then everybody researches it to see, we, we're just looking for those ideas that we can all retire a little early. Yeah, exactly. Amen. And, um, um, and uh, yeah, so that's, I, this was one of those ideas that came up and we're like, hey, we're going to try it. We're going to try it. We're going to get out here and then we'll see. Um, I want to kind of transition to leadership because you've had an amazing career. You mentioned uh, Burton and Nike and, and your stops here at Kane now and even launching your own company. I noticed on your LinkedIn, you had a quote, um, chaos to calm, keeping your head when everyone around you is losing theirs. And I, and I that spoke to me because a lot with my leaders and my vice presidents, it's something I always try to teach is, you know, that cool, calm and collected, you know, even though the, the kind of the military analogy, like even if there's chaos going around, you got to be that, you know, calm force that is leading the troops to the next, uh, the next journey. Um, talk me through like why that quote means so much to you, maybe what you've learned through your leadership on how to instill that in others and, and keep a cool head yourself. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough, especially I think, but toddlers, they definitely help you out on the day to day on sharpening that skill set. Um, but I think there's always, there's always ways, there's always things that are going to knock you off your, off your horse on a day to day. I'll, 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 um, I'll go back to one of my, one of my biggest examples when I was at Nike, the, the, um, the night, one night we got notes on social media from somebody that a very prominent NBA basketball player was gonna, was gonna change his number and give it to a to a um, to a new teammate that was coming and I'm trying to be coy about all this yeah. and 
Uh, that was great and all. He was trying to entice said teammate to come to the team. Can I guess? <laughs> You're more than welcome to. LeBron and Anthony Davis. <laughs> So the night, <laughs> the next morning, we roll into the office and we all obviously, you know, we work on tremendously long timelines and lead times on product. You know, we're trying to make sure that we're, you know, are, um, at, at the bigger companies and you're taking orders from major players. And basically we had, I don't know, X amount of millions of dollars of product that was on the water. Yeah. And we immediately had to like, we were, so we're freaking out, obviously the other, you know, so that was a big issue trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to walk this back? You know, this is a very focal point. They've talked about it on ESPN already. This yeah. Morning. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the other one was the, was the Jersey rip issue that happened. And these were all things where, you know, just getting into that category at the time was things that you had to just keep, you know, everyone right. had all hands on deck. And, you know, very small part of that on my side, but there was a lot of people at the factory level, a lot of people at the, um, but those were times where you couldn't allow the enormity of the situation to derail your, your, just your cognitive approach and how, and your creative solving, your creative problem solving. Those were, and it's all about, I always talk about one of my, one of my biggest mentors that I ever had at Nike. She always said, figure out immediately what the rules are so you can learn how to bend and break them. Mm. And I think that was one of the biggest things. So it's staying calm, but it was also, okay, how do we do things unconventionally? Yes, we're a huge boat in this water as a huge company, X amount of billions of dollars a year, but how do you figure out creative ways to solve these problems that are hitting you um, head on? You know, do you have to wait two years? To, you can't wait two years to solve the problem. You have right. to do how do you do that? And those were some of the days where you just had to, not lose your cool with your team, with your, 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 you know, your partners in, um, in brand. Yeah. And other parts One of, of my it. favorite quotes is being positive in a negative situation. Isn't naive. It's leadership. <laughs> and I feel like, right. Like leaders in that moment where you have millions of dollars worth of <laughs> jerseys on its way and you got this stuff going on in the news. It's like, all right, team, this really sucks. And this is not ideal. And we're going to stay late tonight, but let's at least, like you said, what do, what do we have at our disposal? How can we start sipping away at this rock to make some progress? Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's not the solution right away, but just progress is progress at some point. Exactly. Um, it was just really just trying to take a breath, take a yeah. breath. Because sometimes, like I said, the enormity of the situation can really just kind of paralyze you. And it re you really just need to be like, okay. And, you, and your, your training kicks in or your experience kicks in and you go, right. okay, this is how we have to solve this. This is where we should start. You get input from the team, the other experts in your world, and you put all that into the blender and you come up with a plan and you move. I forward. love it. Um, another, another thing you mentioned that I saw online was it gives you great satisfaction in the coach and elevate team members. You know, what have you seen in your career? Talk me through like tools or maybe exercises that you've done with your team members. I, I hear a lot from my team about career pathing, about where are we going? Um, maybe even just motivation month to month, quarter to quarter, year to year. Any like tools or tips for the listeners that you've used in your career that you've seen, you've got a lot of great feedback on, or you like to continue to use as you grow? Yeah, I think it's make it's it's all about culture. It's all about making it a really great place to work that you don't feel like you just talked about. There's not chaos when you walk through the mm -hmm. door. Um, you know that you've got a stable working environment that you come into, and I say working environment, but but it's obviously that's more of a um, not a really a brick and mortar type situation. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, that could be through, through zoom or whatever, yeah. but knowing, and also knowing that someone's got your back, I think, you know, everyone makes mistakes. It's going to happen, but it's knowing someone that's going to be there for you to give you, um, the chance to make mistakes and learn from them fail quickly. That's, that's the, what I, you know, fail quickly and learn is always one of the yeah. things I would talk about. It's like, cool. You made a mistake. Fine. I think it was always the point from my point of view was letting someone know, here's the goal. Here's what we need to do. There's never one road to get to that place. So I would always try to give um, anybody who was on my team the freedom to approach problems and from different points of view, if they were on the same team, like I said, it doesn't have to be done the same way. Someone might not work a nine to five or someone might not like to do the specific presentation type, or someone might not like to do notes in a specific way or recaps in a specific way. Right. And it's all from your point of view to really take what they are best at and really harness that and let them do that. 
as opposed to trying to get them to fit into your ideal situation. As a leader, you want them to do what they need to do in order to do their best work, not to put them in a box. And that was always one of the things that I tried to do um, during any of the times that I was able to, and I had the opportunity to, and the, um, you know, the, to, to manage a team, you know, whether that be two people in my smallest role at Nike, which was SB or 13 to 15 people at my last one. So, um, that was always how I tried to approach it. I think it. one thing that's tough for, in my, in my perception, tough for new managers to grasp is it's uncomfortable conversations are tough and nobody teaches us how to have those. Our parents usually don't sit us down and teach us how to do that. Our teachers in school, our professors, you know, giving somebody feedback or radical candor or letting them know that you're disappointed, what have you, God, is it awkward? And God, as a leader, does it feel like you're being a jerk and you're being a, you know what? But it's so imperative as a team to have that type of feedback. If you run the wrong route, I got to be able to pull you on the sideline and let you know you, you ran it wrong. And here's the impact of you running this wrong again. Um, have you coached managers through that? Uh, have you kind of built that muscle over time? Like walk me through uh, that. As yeah, well. that's a tough, that's a tough one. What you said, it's, it's just, you know, 90% of it's just having the conversation. Yeah. And I think it's, it's just, and if you've built an open and honest conversation where forget open door, but open, honest conversation, it's like, Hey, someone can come in and say, Hey, like, um, you know, I might need you to help me by acting differently. Or, you know, I want that. That's a two way street. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. not a, um, a dictatorship. It's that's not what being a manager is. So I think it's really opening the door um, theory, not what, not, 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 not specifically, but opening the door to allow there to be that conversation back right. and forth, not this is the way or the highway. Yeah, and like, you're right. If there's constant feedback, then it just is another piece of feedback. But if it's only feedback, when they make mistakes, then it becomes, you know, exactly. an exactly. the, the positive, the positive always outweighs the negative. And I think that's, we were talking about toddlers earlier. It's like, I, I, I watched so many, like, not podcasts, but like, you know, um, Instagram follows about yeah. how to talk to kids, how to, how to do that. And I'm not likening, um, being a manager to, of people to managing your, your kids. There's a little there, bit of parenting going on there. Yeah, for sure. there's, well, there's some, there's some things yeah, that are dynamic. positive stuff is always outweighs the negative. So you're going to get a lot more, you know? Yeah. I read an article from, um, Harvard business review one time that for every negative piece of feedback, you need six positive pieces of feedback to outweigh it. So because that negative, you know, it hurts the person's soul a lot. So you kind of have to balance that. And so it, that way, that, yeah. it's always looking back. Honestly, like I didn't start where I am. I started and how I got to where I am was because of amazing people that yes. I've come across along the road. So I've tried to take up a piece of each of those people um, and incorporate those into how I approach the, the work. Um, whether that be through the current work that I'm doing or managing as well. But it was always that I'm an amalgamation of all the people who have right. come for me. I didn't, I, I started by getting negative feedback. And, exactly. And that's so I'm huge. Where I think people project on others. Like, why don't you understand this? Why, how do you possibly make this mistake? Like, well, you learned through 13 years of making similar mistakes. And that's why you're able to catch them earlier. Now that person hasn't had that same, you know, that same process or what have you. So um, I love that. I have some rapid fire questions here towards the end of the program to just get your thoughts on. Um, you mentioned you uh, obviously podcasts and some Instagram follows, but any book or podcast or newsletter that you consume kind of weekly, daily that uh, you enjoy or get a lot of value out of? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's, it's tough when you, it comes to the podcast. I honestly don't have a lot of um a lot of extra time. Uh, yeah. I try to listen to music when I run. That's usually my only time because that helps keep me a little bit more focused. But I've always been, you know, I mean, how I built this um, yeah. has always been a big thing. Um, um, Mikey Taylor, he's such so approachable. I don't know if you know him. It's, he has to do his next skateboarder. So it's kind of in my world. Yeah. And then, um, you know, when it comes to money and then, um, you know, Ramit as well, he's, he's a a very approachable way. Um, you know, Gary V honestly, like he's everywhere now, but yeah, how he approaches talking to multiple generations of people is, is, a, is, and it's just so easy to understand. I think yeah. that's where, so those are, those are a couple of things I think when it comes to that. And there's a bunch on, on the kids stuff that I, I, I try to, I try to, I bet, I try I this, bet. honestly, if it wasn't for having to be on social media with, with clinch a lot more now that I have to kind of drive that point of view. Um, I, I, I honestly would try to step away a little bit and try to focus on the family as much as I can. Yep. But, but 
now that I have to, when I do have to be on there, I do try to find educational versus, uh, yeah, just yeah, the following. And um, <laughs> based on kind of being busy on both sides of the fence, any tools, resources, apps that you use that you just could not live without that makes your life easier. Keynote is obviously my friend. Um, I visually have to have to conf, uh, take a brief design all the time, speak with the factory. Visual always helps when there's a little bit of a language barrier. Um, our factory obviously is in China for the gloves and is in is in Brazil for our footwear, if you've yeah. had a chance to walk in. So um, it, visual is always is a, is a very you know universal language to so showing somebody something that way. So I'm always using those tools and Illustrator. Love that. And, and, uh, and Keynote, I think when it comes to, um, I'm not an Excel guy. I can't, I cannot do it. I do whatever I can to get, get by, but it's, <laughs> um, uh, but I think those are the two things I think I use on a day-to-day -day basis that help me get my point across in the day-to-day. -day. And then obviously. You're, you're uh, not a Google Sheets guy. I am Google, not. Uh, Google Slides. I am not. No, no. <laughs> I, Google Slides changed my life because you could have so many people in the same exact keynote, if you will, that you can uh, you can tag team a lot of stuff, which I love. But we do, we, I've used it a couple of times with my partners. It, it, he likes to use it. So if he starts a project, we um, we, we go that route. Um, but uh, yeah, I think those are the ones that that I use the most. I love it. Yeah. Um, well, man, thank you so much for breaking down not only some really cool innovative stuff you're doing on both companies, but also the leadership stuff you've learned at Nike and your whole career and just a really awesome conversation and I really appreciate it, man. No, I appreciate your time. And, and, I, and again, like, I think if you have any other, you know, I would love to talk to you again. I think. Of course. Yeah, Part two. As, as both these, as both these companies grow, they're both in their infancy. I love it. Um, hopefully we see some, we see some growth in these. I'm, I'm just excited to start recovering after my workouts, man. You know, I felt like an old man. Maybe this will get some more uh, juice in my legs. That's Let me know. And I'll tell you what we've got coming down the pipe and we'll get you a little code to get you in the footwear. Oh, my man. I appreciate what you it. Think. Cool. Thanks so much, Jason. All right. Thank you so much. All right. All right bye. All right, there he was, Jason Del Soldado, the head of product at Kane Footwear and co-founder at Clinch Golf. I think it was awesome to see how he's approaching both companies uh, from a product lens, uh, from an audience. And, and, and But a lot of that stays true, right? With storytelling, being authentic, solving a problem, the value prop, uh, being able to test things out on social and get feedback via reviews, using ambassadors and influencers in order to attract a different audience and increase your distribution. These are all themes that we've... Uh, you know, heard a lot on uh, with a lot of our experts on the show over the uh, years and over um, the last few episodes in particular. So, so excited to talk to him. I, I also love the the segment about leadership. I love that quote. Uh, Figure out what the rules are so you can break and bend them. That's a great piece of advice. And just overall, just a lot of knowledge from a guy that spent so much time at the likes of of Nike and, and what he's doing now with Kane and Clinch Golf. So. As always, I want to thank producer KG, KDO. Uh, how about Dana helping out with this podcast as well? Episode number 91. Appreciate all of you for all your help and all that you do. Uh, this has been yet another edition of the Business of Social podcast. My name is David Brickley. It's all been powered by STN Digital.